So let me now introduce our speaker of today, Wouter Hoogkamer, one of the previous winners of the Gerrit Jan van Ingescheno Promising Young Scientist Award. Uh, some 15 years, if I'm correct, Wouter started in the Master Program of Human Movement Sciences after completing uh, his Master's in Civil Engineering in Delft. And Wouter and I first met in 2008 when he participated in a course about the mechanics, energetics, and control of locomotion. And Wouter turned out to be one of our best students. I think he finished the course with nine and a half points out of 10. He had a keen interest in running, and he was also a, a gifted and competitive runner himself. And if I understand it, he now does a run commute. I never heard of this, but <laughs> perhaps we'll learn more of this. Uh, so in 2008, Wouter also applied for the Gerrit Jan van Ingescheno Promising Young Scientist Award and was one of the winners. And this award allowed him to do a research project in the lab of Roger Kram, the University of Colorado. And I think this was more or less the start of his uh, academic career. So it's not only name and fame, but it's also a boost for your career and an opportunity to actually do your first research. Um, and after completion of the Human Movement Science Master in 2010, Wouter started the PhD at the University of Le Leuven on the role of the cerebellum in the control of walking. And he completed his PhD in 2014 and went back to the States to work another four years in Roger Crown's lab. And after hesitating to come to Europe again or to stay in the US, <laughs> he decided to stay in the US, is now a leading scientist at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Wouter published about 45 papers on aspects of the mechanics, energetics, and control of locomotion from patients with neurological disorders to marathon runners. And we still like the things that we inspired him with our course in 2008. <laughs> and especially with his research on runners and running shoes, uh, Wouter has attracted quite a bit of media attention in the US. I think we would be envious of him uh, in that respect. And today we'll talk about linking biomechanics, energetics, and distance running performance. Wouter, you have the electronic floor. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, present to my former professors um, and uh, their latest newest additions and students uh, and researchers. Um, I guess you can see my screen yep. um, and um, already highlighted um, after the fun start of this seminar that I also won this award uh, in 2008 or nine uh, around that time. Um, there we go. So first of all, I just want to start off with a disclosure. So part of my research uh, in the past uh, years has been funded uh, through research contracts with industry uh, in the running world. So first in Colorado, mainly by Nike, and uh, since then um, uh, by Puma and Saucony. So whenever I talk about uh, running footwear, um, just wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, some of that was funded through research contracts. And then, um, Martin already gave a nice overview of this one. So um, basically started out um, as a human movement scientist uh, in uh, Amsterdam here, uh, working with Nuke Martin and Jos. Um, then uh, went to Belgium to work with Jacques and at that time Short was also there. Um, so that was great. Um, I spent a lot of time in Colorado, um, mainly working on uh, both cycling projects and running projects. And um, since, Two and a half years, I've been uh, assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts. Um, and uh, we just recently did a lab cleanup uh, and organized uh, the shoes that we have lying around, uh, which you can see in the, on the right side. And as Martin also was saying earlier, I'm really excited about running myself. Um, so I started as a track runner um, back in the early 2000s, and I've now moved on to uh, ultra running and I run 50 mile races and things like that. Uh, and the run commute is um, mainly before COVID. I uh, I often ran 
to work uh, every single day. Um, take some organization, but it's doable. Um, but uh, since COVID, um, I'm not always going in. So it's, but when I do, I, I might run. So how uh, long just, do you run? Just um, so, so the run to work is about six miles, but I used to okay. take a detour, I make it eight <laughs> miles an hour, um, an hour and something. Um, yeah, so it's, it's nice to get an hour of running in every day uh, by just running to work. Um, just so for you who haven't been on this side of the ocean uh, or haven't stared at the map, um, University of Massachusetts all the way in the, in the northeast corner in the area called New England um, and a very uh, densely populated area in general with the states, a lot of small states with high number of people, but um, specifically Amherst itself, it is a fairly small uh, college town and um, we live here out in the woods and um, specifically during COVID, I did not necessarily see a lot of people. Um, so again, people ask me, why didn't, do you like it in the US? And don't you think that that is bad in the US? Well, I don't know all of the people that live here, um, but the people that I generally run into are all very nice. Um, but uh, like I said, I don't know all of them. So things, things differ between areas within the country. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, the two hour marathon. So um, basically I'm gonna sort of give the overview of what happened in the past six to seven years and how we sometimes were involved with research leading up to it and sometimes just were interested as running scientists to see if we could quantify some of these aspects um, that we saw happening uh, without necessarily um, informing any decisions there on tactics or anything. Um, so basically, um, the topic became more and more prominent when uh, Kimeto in, in 2014 ran the first marathon in less than two hours and three minutes, uh, which basically showed that we just had to run two and a half percent faster. And at that time, um, Nike uh, got really involved with that. Um, and their first question was basically, so if we want to allow a runner to run about two and a half percent faster, um, how can we do it? And, and how can we quantify whether footwear or aerodynamics or, um, or course design could help with that? Um, so generally, as scientists, you would then run a, a big control study where um, you have a participant run a marathon in shoe A, and then you have a participant run another marathon in shoe B, and you have enough participants to eventually try to find out whether shoe A is better than shoe B. But obviously, running controlled experiments in, in the area of marathon running is really complicated because it takes two to two and a half hours or um, for recreational runners, even up to five. Um, so, so there's problems with, with trying to really see what happens during a marathon um, because you can't just run marathons back to back and all of them will be slightly different in course and weather and training. Um, so the simplest solution for that uh, would be to just quantify the metabolic cost of running uh, and, and see how you can manipulate the metabolic cost of running and then hoping that that will translate to a faster marathon. Um, so generally we do that by measuring running economy, like I said, metabolic rate, metabolic cost of running. Um, we measure oxygen uptake and carbon dioxide production, make sure that the participants are at a comfortable aerobic uh, speed that they can uh, do this, um, these trials without building up any fatigue or without going into the anaerobic domain, because at that point, uh, our oxygen measures uh, do no longer correlate with the uh, majority of the energy um, utilization. So that is in theory uh, kind of what we did. So in theory, if you have two runners that have the exact same VO2 max, maximum oxygen uptake and lactate threshold, then the runner who has a better running economy, who uses less metabolic energy to run at a specific speed will run faster. Or if you look at an individual, if you can improve their running economy and maintain their VO2 max and lactate threshold, they will run faster. Um, and then the first question is, well, how much faster? Um, so that is basically the first project we did at that time in Colorado, uh, funded by Nike. Uh, we set out to find out um, 
basically, if you run, if you need 1% more energy, will you run 1% slower? Or if you could use, have 1% better running economy, so use 1% less metabolic energy, will you run 1% faster, one and a half, a half? Um, basically, we didn't know at that time. Um, so the first assignment we had was to sort of alter running economy reliably. And at that point, we didn't necessarily have shoes that we know that were going to be better. So we decided to make running economy worse, so making it harder. And we did that by adding shoe mass. And it's been already been known for um, early, since the early 80s that just adding mass to the shoe will increase metabolic cost. Um, and it has been confirmed often since then in general, every 100 grams that you add to the shoe or the foot will increase metabolic cost by about 1%. Um, so that's what we decided to do. We we're gonna have runners run in different shoes with added mass. We would quantify changes in running economy. And then we would also have them run time trials in these different shoes and quantify the changes in time trial running performance. Again, we wouldn't do marathons. Um, we decided that a three kilometer would be representative in that case. <clears throat> Even though a three kilometer might be in the anaerobic domain, sort of the overall energetics of the puzzle would still um, sort of work. Um, so obviously the important thing is when we have people run these time trials, we didn't want them to uh, be biased by knowing that they would be running in a heavy shoe. Um, so. Uh, Nike provided us with three shoes that looked very similar, um, but were different in shoe mass. So they added lead BBs um, here in the tongue and in the side pockets so that we had a control shoe of 200 grams, uh, 100 gram heavier shoe and a 300 gram heavier shoe, um, making the shoe 500 gram heavier. Uh, again, with the goal that the participant doing the time trial would not be aware that they would be running in heavy shoes. And then obviously you might think, well, that seems quite substantial. They probably will feel that. Uh, interestingly enough, there's um, some research on this and people had shown before that uh, people are indeed pretty good at uh, sensing the mass of shoes, um, but mainly when they have them in their hands. As soon as they do not touch them with their hands and have shoes only on their feet, uh, people are not that good at perceiving differences in shoe mass. And the other thing that we had on our side there is that we were gonna do these time trials a week apart. And they didn't know, the subjects did not know we were even studying shoe mass or running performance. So there was no trigger for them to think about the shoe mass. It was a week apart. We just had to make sure that they didn't touch the shoes with their hands, which was obviously, um, challenging, uh, but um, we came up with a deception. Um, so we pretended to also uh, measure their kinematics using this uh, IMU or accelerometer that we had to place exactly on the right location on the foot. It was a very delicate accelerometer. It needs to be exactly there. Let me just put it there. Let me wrap it. Let me put your sock over it. Let me put your shoe on, make sure it's still on the same location. Um, so yeah, soon after I arrived at the US, the first thing they taught me was how to deceive uh, people um, for the outcome of the research, um, but it works. Um, so then how did we assess performance? Like I said, we did these time trials um, a week apart. Participants never touched the shoes with their hands. They did not know that there was a study on shoes. They thought we were doing a reliability study in relation to VO2 max and time trial performance. Um, and then the other thing we tried to control as best, same time of day, same day of the week, um, made sure that um, they were following a sort of a, a normal pattern, that they um, had normal sleep and normal diet, and normal training the day before the time trial. Uh, we also didn't want to get too excited ourselves, um, going all out with cheering them on in the light shoe and sort of um, being less excited in the heavy shoe. So we, we made sure we standardized our cheer, cheering trip. We didn't want to just stand there while they were running there. Uh, so we did want to encourage them in some way. So we just make sure that after the first lap, we would always say, all right, you're off to a good start. 
And then during the second lap, we would always say, all right, looking strong and things like that. So we all organized that, that every single week we set the same thing at the same time um, so that we were also limiting our own uh, influence on the outcome. And obviously the runners were not able to look at their watches and um, even though we did record the split times, uh, they didn't see them um, until after they had done the last time trial. Um, yeah, we've seen the shoes, counterbalanced order. So some people started one week in the control and um, other subjects would start the first week in the heavy shoes. Um, and then obviously after we did the time trials, we started with that um, so that those were a week apart, but then we wanted to do the Rani economy measures within a single lab visit, because obviously when you have different lab visits, there's uh, differences in calibration of the analyzer and other things. Uh, even with their diet. So we want to make sure that the running economy was in one visit, um, which made it at some point tricky to keep changing shoes. Um, you can do that one time after the first trial, ask them to come up and look at the accelerometer and switch the shoes behind your back and put it back on. Um, but if you're, you've done that two or three times, the subject gets suspicious. But at that point, we felt like, okay, so the time trials, they were unaware of the shoe mess during the running economy testing in the final day in the lab, they will pick up there's something going on with the shoes because we keep asking them to take their shoes off. Um, but we feel that it's, it's probably fairly hard to sort of actively change your uh, running economy or your oxygen uptake being biased by shoe mess. You could change your time trial outcome by going out more aggressively or slower uh, but for running economy, that, that's going to be uh, a little harder to uh, purposely change uh, being aware of footwear. So what did we see? Um, overall, running economy sort of confirmed the trend. Uh, maybe it wasn't fully linear, but um, on average, uh, we saw about a 1.1% slowing down, uh, or not slowing down, increase in metabolic rate. So they use more energy. Uh, about 1.1% more for every 100 grams. For the performance, um, we didn't see that. We saw that they did slow down, um, but it was only 0.8%. And at that time, um, we thought, oh, that's close enough. Um, that's almost directly proportional. And that's how we concluded our paper at that time. Um, but obviously, 1.1% is not 0.8%. Um, and um, it took, uh, took us a while to think about this and figure it out, but um, eventually I thought about it more and it made total sense. Um, so in 2019, we published a follow-up theoretical paper where we go back to this concept. And like I said, it, if you look at it like this, it makes total sense. And it also nicely um, predicts that exact same outcome in the data. So um, the only reason why you would expect that people would run 1% faster if they have a 1% uh, improvement in running economy is when the relationship between running speed and uh, oxygen uptake would be directly proportional or recht um, evenredig. And uh, in that case, um, because it's going through the origin, it's a straight line, um, a change of X percent on the one axis will um, go inside with this the same change in percent on the other axis. Um, so the question is, does running energetic data look like that? Um, um, and so we took a study that, that studied running energetics over a very wide range of velocities. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they sort of saw that um, it's not fully linear, but maybe you can linearize it at some point. Um, uh, but you can definitely see that here, the slope for the slow speeds is less steep than the directional proportional slope. And here at the faster speeds, um, the slope is steeper. And this is just for treadmill running. Then obviously when you do a time trial or you run a marathon, you run over ground and you're moving through air and um, there's some air resistance that will come at a metabolic cost. At slow speeds, it's small, but at high speeds, talking about two hour marathon, it, it, it might add up. So we added that from a study using wind tunnel data that was performed in the 70s. <clears throat> and at that point, we see that um, the, this curve 
curve of linearity becomes even more pronounced and um, the disconnect becomes even bigger where there's even a steeper slope here at the fast speed domain. Um, um, so when we sort of uh, put the tangential line in there, we can see that um, these lines are touching around three meters per second, which basically means that if you run slower than three meters per second and you get a 1% metabolic benefit, you will run be able to run more than 1% faster. On the other side, where the line uh, and the relationship is steeper, um, when you get a 1% metabolic benefit, you will not be able to run a full percent faster. Actually, the difference will be smaller and smaller the faster you run. Um, when we put <clears throat> our data back in from our time trial study, we saw that it actually matches this very well. We saw at the speed that the people were running, um, if they get about a 1.1% metabolic benefit, they get a 0.8% time benefit, exactly matching what we saw. And also we took the two hour, the two hour marathon, sort of seeing like, um, if you are running at this speed for every percent, you only get about two thirds of a percent benefit in time. <clears throat> All right, so we got our framework set now. We know that if we can quantify changes in running economy, we can look at the speed that people are running at and can predict how much faster they will be running when they're running a race. Uh, and again, within the energetic framework that would apply to a three kilometer time trial, but also for a, for a marathon uh, race. Um, so then now we can analyze kind of what happened. So in, in May, 2017, uh, there was the breaking two event where they tried to break two hours. They got came 25 seconds short. And then two and a half years later in uh, Vienna, an, an unorganized attempt where um, they actually uh, Kipchoge was able to run a marathon in less than two hours, took him 20 seconds less. <clears throat> and as you can see from the pictures, um, these weren't just regular city marathons. These were events that were specifically organized to allow him to run as fast as possible. So obviously it's Nike. So there was a, a footwear component. <clears throat> um, there was aerodynamic drafting, as you can see in both pictures where he was running behind the pacemakers and both events were sort of organized on a very flat course uh, to minimize the effect of running up and downhill. Um, so now knowing that we have tons of literature data on how footwear or aerodynamics or courses or slopes might affect running economy, we have our framework that we can then use the literature that gives us changes in running economy and translate those into changes in running performance over a marathon. So that's what we did. <clears throat> that's what we're gonna be talking about. I'm not gonna be talking too much about the running shoes because I have done that before um, through some people in the audience, many of them. Um, but basically uh, we studied this, these shoes that Nike sort of developed um, around 2015 um, that um, were substantially better than existing shoes at that time. So. We didn't necessarily study the exact same shoe that Kipchoge was wearing when he broke the two hour marathon or when he tried it before in 17. Um, but um, we started with sort of the first version of this generation of shoes that he was actually wearing when he won the 2016 Olympic marathon in Rio. Um, and this is sort of the prototype um, of that shoe that we tested in the lab back in 2015, 16. Um, basically, very briefly, we wanted to make sure that we were comparing it to serious running shoes and not just um, some heavy trainers or uh, Zeeman Um So we um, we compared them to uh, the Adidas Boost 2, which was the shoe that Kimeda wore when he set the world record, and um, the fastest Nike shoe at the time, which Kipchoge had been running a 204 marathon in before, um, and compared it to this new prototype, which um, Obviously, most people know have a, has a carbon fiber plate in there, uh, but also is built of a new uh, modern foam um, that, that is uh, more compliant and highly resistant. Uh, we also tested this. I'm not 
going to show that data, but uh, it is indeed a softer shoe. Softer spring allows for more energy storage, and um, it's also a higher grade foam that returns more of the energy. It's uh, losing less energy to its physical elasticity. Um, so what did we see? We tested 18 really good runners, um, and um, they came in three different days to run at three different velocities. Um, here we see the data for the 14 kilometers per hour, um, where you see um, the individual data with the gray lines and the group mean with the, the, the bold black line. And you see that between the Nike Streak uh, baseline shoe and the Adidas baseline control shoe, there was no group difference. Some people went up, some went down. If we then added on the data for our prototype shoe, um, we saw that uh, all 18 subjects uh, used less uh, metabolic energy at this speed in that shoe. Uh, the group average was 4% less, and we saw that consistently uh, across the other two faster speeds that we tested as well. So basically, sort of independent of speed over this range, um, on average, the whole group used 4% less in this prototype shoe, which then uh, Nike uh, happily adopted in the name of the shoe to call it the Vaporfly 4%. Uh, again, after that, they built the next percent and then even an Alpha Fly, and that was the shoe that um, Kipchoge was wearing. Um, just like I said early in the disclosures, this was a, a research contract with Nike that uh, allowed us to do the study. So some people were saying that Nike bought the results or uh, that we were not fully um, unbiased there, but um, a follow-up study uh, from uh, another group um, did a very similar study, also comparing uh, the same Adidas shoe with then the Vaporfly 4% that they bought in stores. Uh, and they saw um, the same thing that between these two shoes, the difference was um, 4%, um, uh, again, uh, confirming our finding. Um, and then, like I was saying, since then, newer shoes have been developed um, and um, other brands have similar shoes. And if you compare those, um, it seems to be that um, the Alpha Fly um, is even slightly better than the next percent, which is probably slightly better than the four percent, even though in this study, they compared it to different control shoes and saw differences of around three um, percent. I think this is probably the first time I uh, show an Instagram picture as a reference in my uh, presentation. But in the meantime, uh, this study actually has been accepted for publication uh, and is available uh, to find if you're interested. Uh, again, comparing the different brands of the newest um, shoes that combine this new foam with the carbon fiber plate in different uh, geometries. Um, like I said, many of the brands have this. Um, now this whole battle um, where all of the brands somewhat have been able to catch up with Nike uh, is moving um, its battle feet to the track um, where we now have these super spikes which also have carbon fiber plates. Um, they got either modern foam or even airbags. Um, and again, uh, performances are being improved. There's no real data um, on this. And if you're interested on why not, um, we, we, we discussed that. Um, in this uh, paper listed here, basically because when you're talking about middle distance, distance, middle distance running performance, um, it's harder to quantify running economy at, at the exact speed that people are running at. Um, so that is gonna be uh, a little tricky to put a running economy number on a middle distance or a sprint spike, um, but there will be other ways to quantify the benefits. All right, um, so, Footwear, um, again, we saw a 4% improvement in the first prototype of a group of 18 real good runners, um, a constant from 14 to 18 kilometers per hour. However, Elliot Kipchoge is running 21 kilometers per hour, and um, he might not be a responder or um, the effect at eight, 21 kilometers per hour might be less than what we saw from 14 to 18. Um, I have no data available on that. So we can only assume that the shoes helped, but we wouldn't know exactly by how much. Um, then the other big difference, again, from the pictures obvious is the aerodynamic drafting, which in a traditional city marathon, 
uh, people have PACERs, uh, but the official rules for record eligibility state that, um, yes, you can start the race with PACERs, but as soon as the paper PACERs are tired and drop out, um, that's it. You can't have a new uh, PACER start at that point to shield you from the wind, which uh, for both these events, um, they uh, decided uh, they're not going to worry about. So they did have uh, fresh PACERs starting uh, after relap. Um, which made these attempts both record ineligible. So the official marathon world record is still 201.39 from Berlin. These two uh, marathons do not count because the pacers were um, rotating throughout the race. Um, again, we did try to quantify this. Um, and um, again, this is something that we did sort of after the fact. So there's not a lot of data on aerodynamics in running, obviously, because it's not as fast as Formula One uh, or as fast as speed skating or as fast as cycling. Uh, but when we talk about two hour marathon, um, it, there's some the speed skating up to the reins where there could be some substantial uh, aerodynamic uh, drag forces that could slow you down. And again, drafting uh, could help you overcome that. Um, so there's some data from uh, early 70s, a Pew, um, interesting scientist. Um, um, if you are, have some time to spare, you can read a book about him um, written by his daughter. Um, but uh, he basically had one runner and his one um, run in a wind tunnel behind another runner and um, at one speed and they uh, just turned on um, the uh, fans in a wind tunnel and you see that with the increasing wind velocities, um, energy cost goes up. Um, but if he's not shielded, energy goes up a lot more um, than when he's running behind another runner. So basically, this difference um, seems to be consistently about 6%. I mean, obviously, the axis here is uh, cut at 2 um, so that's what we had been using until uh, more recently, where we say, okay, we got NS1 in a wind tunnel. Overall, it's about 6% uh, reduction in metabolic rate, um, which we can then try to um, relate to performance. However, uh, with modern times, there's modern technologies and people are now very well able to run simulations uh, on this uh, sort of different drafting scenario. So, over the past two, three years, there's been uh, several different scientific articles where engineers have been um, running their different calculations for different formations. Uh, here, just two people behind each other, three people in a row. I've seen up to five people in a row. Um, here we got um, this formation, but also the arrow formation where there were six spacers in front of Kipchoge in Monza and sort of the V formation in Vienna. Um, all of those things have been simulated, and that is really intriguing and interesting. Uh, but the main outcome that we get there is changes in drag force. Um, so we can get, we can quantify uh, changes in drag force while running. And we're interested in how that would change performance. And um, so you might think, well, like speed skating and cycling, we just multiply the drag force times the velocity and we get the power that is lost to drag. Um, and then if we have some sort of running efficiency, uh, we can then translate that to change the metabolic um, power. And then we can uh, then quantify differences in running economy towards difference in performance. And obviously that is how you would do it for speed skating. Um, um, Jos and Martin and Ferdinand um, did that before. Um, however, for running, um, there's a big issue because um, the majority of the energetic cost of running isn't necessarily related to doing actual work. Um, and obviously there's some work in the vertical domain, uh, which you could quantify and you can make an argument about, but the efficiency of doing vertical work, um, which is a lot of bouncing, uh, might be totally different than the efficiency that you would have to uh, have when you want to overcome drag forces in the horizontal plane, right? Um, so again, there's a there's an intrinsic problem with 
is purely focusing on mechanical work during running because of the elastic energy storage and return in a vertical direction. And we don't know how to translate to forward movement. Um, so we suggested a different approach where we have now already um, our computational fluid dynamics calculations and we got our relationship, theoretical relationship between changes in running economy and performance. Now we just need to quantify how drag force or pooling forces affect running economy. And that's kind of what we did uh, with a study um, with a visiting student from Brazil. Um, we sort of copied this, um, this setup that had been used in the 70s a lot um, to look into running efficiency specifically. Uh, but basically, those studies so far had been using heavy weights and slow speeds. And we kind of flipped that where we were looking again, if we're talking about a two-hour marathon and air resistance, we're interested in small forces and high speeds. Um, so we went as fast as we could find our runners, which in this case, um, that could do this aerobically, which was 16 kilometers per hour. And we quantified uh, basically the effect of a four Newton drag force or an eight Newton drag force. And the CFD simulations sort of show that for somebody with the size of an elite marathon runner, that drag force is somewhere from four to eight, around six or seven Newtons, depending on which simulation you like better. Um, so that's where we set that um, force to be. And then we sort of quantified this change. Um, we saw obviously, at every single speed, if you pull slightly harder, energy cost goes up slightly. Um, we then sort of try to find the overall trend. And as you can see here from the individual data, it's pretty much spread out. So on average, we saw that for every percent of body weight that we're pulling backwards, uh, energy goes up with about 6%. However, um, that sort of range for one individual, it was less than five, for another, it was more than eight. Um, and intriguingly, uh, the one subject that was tested in the wind tunnel in the 1970s um, sits right around that 6%. So the N is one uh, was a lucky shot because it, it seemed to be uh, right around the average of the 12 people that we tested. And obviously 12 is only 12. So um, there might be more uh, variation there. Uh, again, for our purposes, we just like to go with this number, but we don't know if Kipchoge is a 5% person or an 8% person here, or if we're looking at other elite marathoners, um, we don't know that. So now we can do this. We have computational, fl computational fluid dynamics. We know that the relationship between drag and energetics, and we know our relationship between energetics and performance. Um, so when we go with the most optimistic simulation uh, from Eindhoven, and they said that with this V formation, Kipchoge's drag could be reduced by 85%. Um, and that means from our relationship that uh, the running economy could be 7% improved as compared to no drafting at all. Remember the, the actual baseline for a city marathon would usually involve some sort of drafting for maybe 30 kilometers. And then uh, we say that as compared to that, like no drafting at all, um, the difference could be as much as five minutes. Obviously, that's the extreme. I don't believe that this formation uh, is going to be maintained that carefully. And we seem to lack a lot of sensitivity analysis from these uh, different studies that all like to do this, but they don't often quantify what happens if the runner is just five centimeters off to the right. And I think that that might change specifically with these complicated formations that seem to be really effective. I wonder like how sensitive those are to small deviations from the optimal uh, formation. Um, and then again, the baseline always involves some sort of drafting too. So that's why the difference between these attempts and city marathons is not necessarily the full five minutes. I don't know how much time I have, but I quickly wanted to say we, we also did some uh, modeling here where, like I said, Putting in new pacers every lap is not allowed, um, but um, if you have all these elite runners and they're all all good marathoners, what you could uh, pace takes 
turns in the lead. And we did some of the four best marathoners in the world in the same race. And they would first, for the first 30 kilometers, draft behind other pacers. When those are tired, they just keep going with the four of them rotating and taking the lead uh, and resting then uh, while in the back of the pack of four. Um, haven't been, uh, hasn't been done yet for running. Um, so it would be intriguing to see if people start doing that when they want to actually break the record within the rules. All right. Um, quickly, maybe about the course design. We also quantified this. This was kind of when Ineos reached out to us saying like, we have, we're looking at some courses um, and you have studied up and downhill running and turns. Can you advise us? Um, so uh, we spent some time with them just saying like turns don't really matter. Um, and obviously you want to just minimize going up and down. Um, and we quantified how much that would matter. Um, so um, technically, again, for record purposes, 42 meters downhill um, is allowed. So basically one meter per kilometer. And theoretically, that would give you about 28 seconds benefit just by itself if you can find the perfect course which meets all the other regulations, but we just dropped 20, uh, 42 meters. Um, but then we also quantified after the fact um, the outcomes of the different courses where they tried to break the two hours. And basically the biggest difference, even though the Formula One course in Monza was specifically chosen because it was a very flat course, uh, they still had 17 laps and were going up and down five meters of elevation every lap versus eventually in Vienna, um, they had way longer laps and uh, elevation changes were only three meters. Um, so when we quantified the difference, uh, we sort of found out on average that um, the difference between the two races based on the turns and elevation changes is 46 seconds but only one of those seconds is due to uh, the difference in the turns because um, all the turns in both cases were fairly wide and then they don't necessarily affect energetic step much. Uh, and if you would just have um, a straight course um, that was fully flat, uh, like no elevation changes um, as compared to Vienna, the difference would be less than uh, we, we models and we, simulated and we found 46 seconds difference. The actual difference between these two events uh, was 45 seconds. Um, but again, there's other differences like the footwear and the pacing formations. Um, so we, we never know exactly what happened, but we, we can get an idea from all this. Obviously, I'm intrigued by this. And now we have figured this out for marathon road racing. Uh, next steps I want to be looking into is how this going with more um, variable terrain, which uh, makes it tricky because um, of how to model the energetics of these uh, different uh, environments and how that then translate into performance. I'd like to thank people I worked with in Colorado, um, both on the course simulations and um, the footwear and the drag forces uh, with Edson and uh, the people in my current lab at uh, UMass and the funding sources. And then uh, time to answer some questions, I guess. Thank you very much, Walter, for an uh, interesting series of studies. I'm curious uh, what your ultimate purpose is and when you're going to be happy. But first, let's give the floor to people that have questions. My only problem is that I cannot see everyone. So maybe someone who has a question can just start speaking. Any questions for Wouter? Yes, I have a question. Um, Wouter, would you know how fast um, so professional marathon runners run a marathon on a treadmill? That is a good question. Um, so theoretically, on a treadmill, there's no air resistance, right? So in our paper, we sort of quantify that scenario too. So I think the difference would be about theoretically six to seven minutes. Um, however, um, I don't have know about any data for these elite marathoners. I do know when, <clears throat> for example, Nike was 
trying to find the best runners to try to do this. Uh, Elliot Kipchoge um, didn't have the best numbers in the lab, probably because he had never run on a treadmill before. Um, so uh, that's intriguing enough by itself. Um, but I, I'm not aware of any real elite athlete that, um, and obviously, as, as we know, like we use these scientific grade treadmills, which are very rigid so that we can see what footwear does. Uh, most people that do run on a treadmill probably have a treadmill that purposely is a little more forgiving and bouncing. Um, and so then you might get an additional benefit from the bounce on the treadmill. The other thing that we uh, nicely ignored here and Professor Dana might um, not agree with that is uh, the thermal regulation, right? So you can run behind the other runners or on the treadmill uh, and you have no air resistance, but you're also losing out on the airflow that's cooling you down, which um, for marathon runners at these spaces is, is probably very substantial. Um, so that, that's another way to, um, to follow up on this work and, and, and think about it a little more uh, uh, ecologically and, and try to see what the thermal regulation does, where we always just say, well, just find time, but it's cold enough that it doesn't really matter, but obviously that, that's not gonna fly fully, so. Okay, thank you. There was another question for sure. Yeah, so hey, Walter, I also had a question, um, uh, and that involves your uh, your thermo or your uh, aerodynamic stuff. So, was there any wind? So, I, I understand that they were running laps, but I also imagine that on this lap, even if the wind is blowing from one direction, the wind will not be constant all over the lap. Yeah, and so yeah. Um, this no, no, that that that's a great um, a great question. So the uh, consider this is like yeah ideal scenario uh, no wind calm day and we really focus on the speed of the runner it involves all the air resistance um, there is ways to um, either in the cfd or the wind tunnel to change the direction of the wind or add wind on top of it so that we will know how it changes the drag forces our experimental study was was a pure backwards force um, so as soon as there's any side wind, um, that's going to change things. And I'm actually in, interested to do a study like that. Um, but it's, yeah, I have to depict my, uh, my battles there because there's technically, theoretically, any combination of, of backwards versus sideways pool could be there. But it would be just interesting to see what happens when you just consistently pull people one way. Um, but then again, like you said, it will fluctuate. Um, so how that will eventually translate to performance is, is uh, another hard question. And so, but the wind conditions were known in these two attempts that you were discussing, or there was zero wind? Uh, I think these were calm days. I do know that Ineos had a ton of wind stations along the course, um, but they haven't really shared any of the data of that. Um, so yeah, we could go back and look at the weather reports of the days. Um, but um, I think in both cases, it was slightly warmer than they had hoped. Um, but I think overall, the wind was not too bad, but it will fluctuate and it will always be some. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question, Wouter. Thank you very much for your uh, talk, uh, which I found very interesting uh, to, uh, to watch. Um, I have a question about the super shoes. Um, so uh, I think, well, my guess is that your explanation that they perform better is that they store part of the energy, right? Uh, and then return it uh, during push-up. Did you uh, make any attempt to uh, quantify the amount of energy that's uh, being uh, returned during the push-up? And, and would that shed any light into the puzzle uh, as to why running uh, requires energy at all. Yeah, so, so well, <laughs> your last part made it a really hard question all of a sudden. Um, but okay. the first part, um, we, we did uh, quantify that. And I, I, I don't have that slide in this deck, I think. But um, what we try to do, obviously, it's not perfect. But often, we just compress the shoe vertically in a machine. Um, 
So when we compared these shoes, um, we saw that sort of the baseline Nike shoe um, uh, compressed uh, about six millimeters on the typical load during mid stands and returned about 65% of the mechanical energy purely vertically. And then the Adidas shoe um, was basically at the same stiffness, but um, more resilient. So um, that is also slightly different foam already that returned 75%. And then um, the Nike shoe with the new foam and the plate in there when compressed vertically um, store twice as much. So they build it really compliant, um, but it returned um, 87%. But basically since it's also so much uh, less stiff, the total energy return is about double. Now there's a lot of discussions about, is it about the actual mechanical energy return or is it about the difference in the mechanical energy that is lost? Um, and I don't know that. I mean, the energy that is lost was fairly similar for all of them because um, the Nike shoe, again, was softer. So it was absorbing more and returning a higher percentage. But the, the actual amount in joules that was uh, re, uh, lost was not that much different. Um, and then how that explains the overall cost of running, obviously, for um, walking, we know that a lot better about sort of, there's a lot of ideas about the metabolic cost of walking being mainly due to um, redirecting center of mass during impact and uh, sort of the collision losses. Um, for running, I don't know, maybe somebody studies people that walk on uh, bumps for air mattresses and can quantify um, the me mechanical energy lost and how that affects the energy cost. I've, I don't know if, if people have done that while they were running. Um, but I guess um, it's just ignoring my question. So it's, it's not coming across. But either way, um, it, it's a good question um, to, uh, to further look into that because we still, like I said, we have the problem. Like we, we just quantify mechanical work. We can pick any form in running and we get a measure. Um, but there seems to be a lot of elastic energy storage and return in the tendons. Uh, obviously, for the tendons to work, the muscles need to be active. You need to generate isometric forces. That is a cost. Um, then here we see that the aerodynamics of running forward is not that important. But what, what is exactly going on? We still really don't know, I would say. Um, so we could look into that more. Thank you. Other question. question. If I may, I was wondering uh, how these developments in shoes, uh, how they work out in competition in terms of fairness, or is this like a, an issue? Yeah, that's a, a very intriguing question. So the what I showed in one of the pictures was that in, in Rio, um, uh, Kipchoge was wearing the first prototype. At that point, um, it was all secretive. Um, and I think for the men's marathon, there were four people that were wearing that shoe. Uh, eventually that was the three medal winners and somebody else who dropped out. Um, so at that point, it was a deliberate action from Nike to, um, to uh, game the field. Uh, basically to provide people with better shoe and not everyone um, so that they would have a competitive advantage. Um, so I'm, I'm not in support of that. Um, however, now sort of we have the rules and if the rules allow this, then I'm all for innovation and sort of trying to do that. Um, so I, I like footwear innovation and I like to improve within the rules. And if there are set rules, it works. Uh, at that point, there were no clear rules, um, and the purists would say, well, I don't like the fact that there's a carbon fiber plate in the shoe, and mm -hmm. sort of going away from the debate whether that's actually the main factor, and if it works how most people think it works. Um, uh, there's something to say about the purity of the sport of running, but then again, where do you draw the line? Should we go back to barefoot running? Because um, some foam is always helping. Um, 
so that's where I'm. I like the fact that there is rules. Um, obviously, as long as there's no motors involved um, or wheels, for me, anything would be awesome. But again, um, we we can't no longer really compare records going back in time as what we see at the track now too. Is a lot of people running really fast with super spikes, um, and as long as every brand has a model that is somewhat comparable and if it's not patented that nobody else can copy it i like it um, but obviously there is patents and there is some issues there with specific materials that not all brands have access to or not all runners can afford so well, yeah, especially with with all know. runners because i remember we had similar uh, issue with uh, the clap skate which was manufactured by viking and viking said that all the competitive uh, skaters are welcome to use our skates. Yeah. So I was just wondering. Uh, that, 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 now Nike released an all blank uh, version of the super spike just before the Olympics uh, in a big ad sort of saying, feel free to, to take a, a Sharpie and write your own brand logo on it and use ours. Uh, obviously the contracts often don't allow that if you are Adidas sponsored um, they want you to run in an Adidas spike. So that's sort of the trick, even though when they are available, and now there are several brands that allow their runners to run in Nike shoes just because they know that they would either do it secretly or they would not be as competitive. So it is still an issue um, within track now. Uh, I think for the road shoes, most brands have been able to catch up um, and probably in a year or two for spikes, it will be the same. So Yo and, and Yav have raised their hands. Um, I don't know till when this goes, but um, happy to, to answer. Well, let's have uh, two more questions. You go first, Yo. Thanks, Yav. Yeah, we're already in overtime. Uh, great presentation, uh, Wout. I enjoyed it. I have many questions also uh, about the spikes. <laughs> I'm interested in speed more than in economy. But um, uh, talking about the running economy and the, 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 the new shoes, uh, is there any uh, information about how, uh, is there interaction with fatigue? Because there is, uh, I can imagine that it, yeah. it changes. Now, good, very valid point. So again, that, that is the problem from going just from running economy to straight into marathon performance, where um, yes, we can measure differences in energy costs over five minutes, but some of these shoes might have different uh, outcomes when you're running them for two hours. Um, for that, we were just thinking, well, they're softer. So for a marathon, they're, they're probably good. Uh, but we, what we do see is that more in the recreational runners um, that uh, might not be running as fast or uh, might be uh, as strong as the elite runners or might not have the right form, we do see that um, again, anecdotal, uh, no studies on this, uh, where um, towards the end of the marathon, these shoes become unstable, um, where, um, where they might not work as well as compared to an old school shoe, which has very minimal foam. Uh, and there's not a lot um, what can go wrong there uh, versus these high stack shoes um, with a plate uh, and minimal amounts of foam to make them as light as possible. So at that point, um, again, form might be deteriorating, which might affect the energetic cost um, in relation to fatigue and build up muscle damage throughout the whole race. Um, again, just anecdotes, no real studies on this that I am aware of, um, but it, it has to be underway because they have been around now for six years or so. So I think people will start looking into this more. Yeah, okay, thank you. I right, indeed was curious about uh, injury also, but maybe uh, Jaap uh, will ask a question about injury, probably. I think. Um, well, not directly about injury, but I was wondering whether, uh, since the, the um, difference in, in uh, energy absorption and impact is, is really quite large between, let's say, the conventional shoes and these ones, uh, have there been any studies looking into the um, the, the kinematics of the leg higher up or muscle activity? Um. Yeah, so um, we did a study where we looked at uh, joint um, mechanics uh, for the legs. Um, and um, 
we saw basically up the chain, very limited chain. So the hip kinematics and kinetics and the knee were spot on. We assumed based on some of the bouncing treadmill studies from early 2000 that if the shoe is so much softer and bouncier, people could sort of adapt a lazy style where they um, run with a more straight leg mm -hmm. um, and uh, reduce the effect or improve the effective mechanical advantage around the knee joint. So that was one of our first hypotheses. hypotheses. Well, we didn't see that. So the knee mechanics were very much the same. We started to see differences at the ankle um, and at the uh, MTP joint. And I think they're partly um, interacting in a way. And the other thing is that there's a lot of people that sort of study the ankle and MTP joint mechanics using carbon fiber plates. Um, but there seems to be a sort of a, a, an additional dimension on top of that when we're talking about a curved carbon fiber plate that is bottom loaded versus if we just go look at the literature, um, some people just use a carbon, flat carbon fiber insole and see a change at um, the level of the ankle, mainly related to shifting the center of pressure forward, uh, which increases the moment arm around the ankle uh, and, and also the um, forces on the calf muscles. Um, but with these curved plates, um, that might necessarily be happening uh, because the curvature allows um, the COP to, to stay more backwards. Um, the other thing is um, with the change in moment arm, not only will there be a change in muscle force, but only in muscle shortening velocity or muscle tendon unit shortening velocity, uh, which then again, how does that affect um, the energy cost of generating these forces at the level of the calf? And how does it change the actual energy store storage in the Achilles tendon when it's happening at a higher force, but a lower rate? So all of those things um, we don't really know. And, and again, some people have been trying to look into it, but not always using the same footwear intervention and then uh, claiming that they do. So they talk about shoes that improve running economy um, using a plate that actually doesn't uh, improve running economy uh, in their own study, but still try to make the argument about the Nike shoe, which they didn't study. So it's just tricky. And specifically what we learned there too is like, the geometry seems to be important and the curvature um, or even the location of the plate again it's nobody has and then even if we do find it out for just this shoe we wouldn't know exactly how it works for next year's shoe who would have a slightly different stiffer plate or different geometry too so sounds like there's a lot of stuff to do still before you're going to be happy yeah but, but ideally <laughs> stepping away from the details and sort of getting back to uh, Matthias's question or, or something where we can say, okay, yeah. so if this is happening, what does that mean in general about the energetic cost of running? All right. So this was one hour of symposium and 10 minutes of um, Gerrit Jan van Ingescheno Promising Young Scientist Award. I suggest that we close the official part of the meeting and that people who want to uh, have a chat with Wouter uh, hang on a little. <laughs>